thanks for the intro. Uh, my name is Simon. Uh, you can find me on GitHub at Simu. Um, my official title is DevOps engineer. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> um, I work at a company called Vision. Yes, it's pronounced Vision like Vision, even though it's spelled funny. Um, we call ourselves the DevOps company. That's probably why I'm my official title is DevOps engineer. Um, we're one of Switzerland's leading DevOps Docker and Kubernetes partners, and also the first Swiss Kubernetes certified service provider since 2016, I think. And we work with a lot of partners. You might be familiar with some of them on this slide. We also have our own open source projects. Apuyo Managed and Apuyo Cloud is our platform as a service offering where we run Kubernetes for you. Project Zen is what I'm going to talk about more later. Um, it's a set of tools that we use to manage our clusters. And KiteUp is a Kubernetes operator for backups, which is part of which is a CNCF project now, and it's fully open source, as is Project Zen. A um, few words about me. I've been at Vision since 2019. Um, I helped create Project Zen, actually, and I'm still one of the main contributors. Uh, previously, I was at ETH Zurich, where I did my PhD in operating system stuff, memory management, and my Rust history. I experimented very early, had some fun, forgot about it, and then came back to Rust when I decided, mm, let's try this advent of code thing. And why not learn Rust with it? Which proved to be quite successful, actually. Um, quick teaser of what you're going to see in the next half hour or so. Um, so our Project Zen configuration rendering tool Runtime, we improved this from seven and a half minutes to one minute 40 seconds by rewriting a tiny part of it in Rust. And yeah, the Rust implementation is about 6,500 lines of code, including tests. And so far in six months, we haven't found any bugs in production, which is super nice. Um, yeah. So quick agenda, that was the introduction. Next, I'll talk a bit about Project Zen so you can see where this whole re-implement in the Rust thing happened in the bigger picture. And then I'll spend the bulk of the time actually talking about what I did in Rust. Um, so Project Zen, it's at, you can see docs at zen.tools. It's a set of tools to securely manage a fleet of Kubernetes clusters. It does hierarchical config management based on GitOps principles. Um, we do reusable components, which are also stored in Git. Um, we have a central inventory of Kubernetes clusters, uh, which you can ask about which Git repos to check out for a particular cluster. And of course, it's an open source project. We didn't build everything from scratch. We're using a lot of other open source <coughs> projects. Capiton, which used to be somewhere in the Google organization, but isn't anymore, is a Python tool which is used to render templates in different languages. Argo CD, you might be familiar with. We use this to deploy stuff on our clusters. Then HashiCorp Vault is our choice for self-hosted secrets management. Renovate for dependency updates of all kinds of things. And finally, GitLab for the Git repository management. Um, architecture. Don't worry about the picture, it's just so there's some color on the slide. Um, we have three tools that we developed ourselves. The central inventory for the Kubernetes clusters, which also does Git repo management, is implemented as a Kubernetes operator with a custom API layer. Um, then Commodore is a Python tool, which wraps around Capitan and orchestrates it. And finally, Stewart is a small in-cluster agent which talks to the tenant and bootstraps and configures Argo CD on each cluster. Um, Commodore pulls in a bunch of Git repos, renders some stuff, and writes it to another Git repo. And the stuff in the final Git repo, which is called the cluster catalog, is what's applied on the cluster by Argo CD. Um, so Project Zen, I said earlier, it does hierarchical config management. 
Um, for this, we use three class, which is used by Capitan to define classes that you can include in one or more targets. Um, this was originally an external node classifier, which could be used for automation tools such as Puppet, Salter, and Civil. Um, Commodore fetches a bunch of Git repos, as I said, and then creates a local preclass hierarchy by doing lots of symlinks uh, based on the YAML files that are stored in many different repos. Um, and the end result is when you render this reclass hierarchy for some of our larger clusters, you end up with like 20 to 25 megabytes of YAML if you actually write it out. Um, reclass, quick example, so we can see what's going on. So you have nodes or targets. Capitan calls them targets. Reclass calls them nodes. Um, you have top level parameters. It's always YAML. It's all in a single directory tree. And you have top level parameters, classes, and, and parameters. And with classes, you define other stuff to include. And in parameters, you basically, you have your configurations. Um, Rendering happens at node granularity, so each node is rendered individually. And then you have these classes, which you can include. Um, classes can include further classes. And the YAML defined in different classes is merged together. So if we have these three things as inputs, what we get is this render node. Um, and parameter merging happens the order of inclusion and stuff in the file always wins over what's included from other files. So if we define param to be class 2 here and class 1 here, but we include class 2 and class 1, we end up with class 1 in the final result. And then reclass also has parameter references, which allow you to refer to other parameters. Um, you can use those both in as class includes and as parameter values. Um, they're delimited by dollars and prices. You can nest them. You can embed them in strings. You can refer to any other parameter you want to. It can be, can be a mapping. It can be a list. It can be a string. It can be anything. Um, yes, that was that. So that's Project Zen. Any questions right now? Um, if not, I'll go to the interesting part. So why did we de re decide to... So what we, re what we rewrote in, in Rust is reclass, the YAML rendering stuff. And why, why did we decide to rewrite it? Well, it started to get slower and slower to render configs for our bigger clusters. We were at over five minutes at the end of 2022. It got worse. We were at seven and a half minutes middle of last year. And when we started profiling this, we realized, well, yes, rendering reclass in Python accounts for approximately five and a half minutes of that, almost. So, yeah, we looked at the Python implementation. We already had fixed a few bugs in there. It's about 5,000 lines of code. There's a bunch of extensions that were added over time. Um, I looked at it. I had the wild idea, can I parallelize this? Well, I probably could, but yeah, Python, unclear ownership, data sharing everywhere, in place mutation everywhere. And yeah, even, even the config structures are shared all across the place. So, well, late 2022, I was bored on a weekend, so I started a side project. I read about PyO3 which is a super cool library to write Python libraries in Rust. And I was like, hmm, maybe I'll just figure out how complicated it would actually be to rewrite reclass in Rust. Um, so I did this for like two weekends and a week of evenings. And I ended up with a proof of concept that actually produced semantically identical YAML to the Python reclass implementation for <laughs> real projects in inventories. Um, it was about three and a half thousand lines of code with some tests and way easier than originally expected. And so, yes, 
last year, we decided when it got to the point where we were waiting for like half an hour to get stuff deployed on our clusters because we had some other inefficiencies and rendered the thing three times for each deploy, um, we decided to actually tackle the problem. And one of the decisions we made was to go ahead with the reclass in Rust implementation. So what we achieved is um, last year, October, November, we were at 1 minute 40 for the same cluster that took 7 minutes 30 previously. Of that, re reclass rendering in Rust is less than 10 seconds. And the other 20 seconds or so that we saved were achieved by parallelizing git repo fetching mostly. So production grade implementation of reclass in Rust. Um, was about four weeks of work for me, plus a few guys reviewing my stuff. Um, it ended up as six and a half thousand lines of safe Rust, including unit tests. We found a couple bugs during acceptance testing where we rendered all clusters for the first time. Um, zero memory bugs. I mean, should be clear if we have safe Rust that it's hard to do memory bugs, but still nice to mention. And my personal biggest takeaway is um, we didn't find any more bugs since we started using this in production last year in October. Um, yes, as I already mentioned, the Python module interface is done with PyO3. We do some simple parallelization with Rayom. And building on CI, um, PyO3 has a super cool tool called Maturin, which allows you to basically build Python wheels for every architecture under the sun with no added effort. Um, yeah, so some high level choices that we made for the implementation. We definitely decided to focus on getting correct results first. Um, correct meaning the same output as the Python implementation. And then as a follow up of that, we didn't worry about complex boroughs or complex lifetimes and just used clone whenever we felt like it, which turned out to be not a problem so far. There's probably some more time in there somewhere, but not sure it's worth the effort at the time. Um, and the base implementation of the parameter merging and reference interpolation actually creates new copies of, of the internal data types. But we do have in-place variants which just use standard memory place to update the um, internal value enum type. So implementation was definitely done in multiple stages. Um, I'll talk about the interesting ones in the following slides. So first we did the parameter reference parser, which I actually, is the one piece of code that I adapted from the first proof of concept. Then we did some YAML loading, which is pretty much just a few calls to survey YAML. Then we implemented <coughs> internal YAML variants of the survey YAML mapping and value types, which have a bit more semantic info about the inventory. Um, then I did a first attempt at mapping and sequence merging without parameter interpolation, which was the next one which also fed back into slight adjustments in the, in the merging code. Finally, some Python interface stuff, so we can actually retrieve the rendered inventory as a Python dict rather than a Python class with, with properties. And finally, parallelization of rendering each node with Rayon. So for parameter reference parsing, we decided to use NUM, which is a parser combinator library. And it's, it's quite nice to use. You basically you define these small functions, which parse a bit of, oh, you don't see my mouse, huh? No, the question is, never mind. I'll use my finger. Um, so you define these functions, which take the input that you want to parse, and they return 
the rest of the input that I didn't parse and the token that I parsed that are the two return values. And so the simplest ones are just, we're looking for the literal sequence dollar opening brace, which is the beginning of a reference and the same for, for a single closing brace, which is the end of a reference. And then string is slightly more complicated. Um, this is a section of the inside of a reference that isn't a reference itself. There's a few things I left out on the slide, which is you can actually escape references and you can escape the escape character, which is these three guys. And then ref content is basically just anything that's not an escaped reference and not a reference open or close. And then, because we parse many of these things, we then join them together to a single string, which we return from this bit of parsing. And then a reference overall is delimited by ref open and ref close. And it contains one or more ref items, which is either another reference or one of these string things. This allows us to parse nested references. And um, the, the okay. higher level parser functions actually return an internal token type, which can either be a token literal for stuff that isn't a reference, or a token ref for stuff that is a reference. Um, for token refs, we actually call this literals. If we parse multiple of them that appear as separate bits in the, the token stream, so we have smaller token streams to work with in the rest of the, of the implementation. Um, yes, um, you can't see the link to crates.io, which I put there on a screen with a different aspect ratio, but um, if you search gnome on crates.io, you'll find it. Then next, I'll say a few words about our value type. It's heavily inspired by Serde Yaml's value. We actually reuse Serde Yaml's number representation, but we, we add a few variants. We make a distinction between string and literal. Um, a literal is simply a string which can't be a reclass reference anymore which allows us to stop the recursive reference resolution. And then our mapping and sequence types. Um, so a sequence is just a vec value in the end. And the mapping has some additional smarts for parameter merging and some reclass features like constant parameters, which you can easily do with so the YAML's mapping. And then we, we do impl froms, so we can easily convert between Sergey YAML and our implementation. Um, and then, yeah, value list is basically when we merge um, the parameters from different files, we create a value list because we could have references that resolve to full mappings, so we can't always immediately merge mappings which is why we just stack them on top of each other and then flatten this down again after we are done with parameter interpolation. Um, yes, yeah, so parameter merging is basically just a big match with some cases which aren't allowed. And yeah, so the simple ones are literal boolean number, which if, if we try to merge this over a mapping or sequence, it's not allowed. Otherwise, we just replace current value with the new value. The other easy ones are mapping and sequence, where we just merge or append. Um, the, the easiest one is null. Everything can be merged over null. So we just literally do a replace. And there's some, some prelude where we also allow null to be merged over anything. And yeah, if, if we, at this point, encounter a string or value list, something went really, really wrong, this shouldn't actually happen. Um, because either if it was a value list, it should have been flattened at some point, 
or if it was a string, the parameter parsing didn't work correctly. Um, yeah, this I reformatted it a bit so it fits on the slide. It's usually we just use cargo format or Rust format. Um, yeah, and then reference interpolation surprise more matching. I omitted the boring ones that just recurs. Um, the string one is, is the interesting one. So for, if we see a string in parameter, parameter interpolation, we try to parse references in the string. The top level token parse function returns none if it didn't find any references, at which point we know, well, there's no references in this string, so we just return a literal copy of it. And otherwise, we call this innocent looking function token render which does a lot of the heavy lifting um, by actually doing lookups in, in root, which is the current state of, of what we have to actually replace the references with the values of the reference parameters. Um, well, this is pop crate interpolate isn't supposed to be used by the rest of the code unless the rest of the code actually knows what they're doing. Um, we recommend using the render or rendered methods, which actually track resolve parameter resolution state and do interpolation and flattening. Yeah. Let's start then a quick tour of PyO3. Um, so PyO3 has these annotations which allow you to basically tell the compiler or the PyO3 macro, macro scrite to how to generate Python code for your Rust code. Um, you generally want to include the PyO3 prelude, so you get this stuff. Um, you can just mark Rust structs to be Python classes by annotating them with PyClass, and then you can generate properties and getters and setters with PyO3 get and PyO3 set. And this does all the conversion between Python types and Rust types for you. So hash maps get translated into Python dicts, for example. And what you also need to have is a top level function, which, is, which has the same name as your module, which you need to mark as PyModule, and which you use to register your classes in the Python interpreter or functions if you have them. Then Python methods, you can also, you can mark impulse with py methods, in which case they're um, exposed as methods on, on the associated Python class. So this is an example which translates the rendered reclass inventory into a Python dict. Um, you can, there's lots of helper functions in PyO3 which allow you to create new Python objects. Um, the Py object is basically the lock, the global in interpreter lock that you take when, when you get call. It's passed around as a token in any code that's um, called from Python and that wants to do something that's returned to Python. And then you have the dict, you do a set item on it. There's into Py. Um, conversion functions for, for native Rust types. We could implement them, but we opted to expose this functionality as a, as a method on the class. Um, the way this looks in Python is, it's just Python. You import the thing, um, you call the, the constructor, which I didn't show in the slides. Um, you can annotate a method in your PyMethods impl with new which makes it a constructor. Then you can call functions or methods. You can use the properties that we saw earlier. The nodes is defined just with this single PyO3 get here. And this is then a Python dict that we can use as a regular Python dict, or we can call our method that we implemented ourselves. Um, yeah. That's already getting close to the end. Um, once we had this and it was running single-threaded, 
I looked at it and we already knew rendering happens node by node. There's no dependencies between nodes. Um, so I just stuck rayon into the dependencies, imported the prelude, replaced my iter with a power iter. There you have it. So a few words about testing and benchmarking. We have, I counted them, 280 Rust tests. Some are generated with macros. Um, mostly they're written by hand. A lot of them use handcrafted test inventories that are stored as YAML files in the Git repo. We just run them with cargo test currently. I was looking at cargo next test recently because it was featured in This Week in Rust or something but I haven't migrated this project yet. There's a few Python tests um, that mostly exercise the Python API that we expose. Those we, we use PyTest because that's what we're familiar with from Commodore where we have a big PyTest infrastructure. Um, I wrote a couple benchmarks. So we catch performance regressions, kind of. They're running in GitHub CI, so accuracy is so-so. Um, I'm using Criterion because it has some nice facilities. Yeah, so what are we doing currently? Um, we're still working on implementing reclass features. Um, every time you look at the docs, more hidden features pop up for the code. <laughs> um, we don't use any of them, so they're not that important, but we're working on this because we're also trying to make reclass in Rust available to any users of Capitan as I officially integrated and supported inventory backend. Um, this PR is actually now under review, so that should land in, in the next Capitan release, hopefully. Yes, future work. I kind of want to add type stops to the generated Python module, partially because I want to know how you do this with PyO3, and also because we actually do quite a lot of type checking in, in Commodore where we call the reclass implementation. And then we have some wild ideas for other extensions, like we're often annoyed by the lack of fallback default values for parameter references. So if you reference something, if it doesn't exist, um, rendering just fails. And there's currently no way to avoid this. So there's a lot of ugly lookup maps, which we need to manually extend whenever we add new variants and stuff and it would sometimes it would be nice to um, be able to define a fallback value to use when when a parameter is missing and also wildcards for class includes came up in the Capitan community where some people would like to include anything that's def.star or something like that which currently isn't supported either but it's actually trivial to do with the Rust implementation at least. Um, yes, that's pretty much it. To recap, um, speed of a, speed of a free class itself by re-implementing it in Rust was over 30 times. We went from five minutes 20 to under 10 seconds. Um, this translates to a more than 4x speed up of the actual overall um, rendering of, of our Cluster configurations from seven and a half minutes to one minute, 40 seconds. We're using the Rust implementation in production since October last year. It's running more than 50 times a day on average. And so far we haven't found any bugs. And my personal takeaway is um, with PyO3, it's super straightforward to write Python modules in Rust. Um, it's also super straightforward to publish the re resulting Python module on PyPy. Um, Maturin handles all of that for you. And Maturin actually generates a GitHub CI configuration that, all, that does all of this, including building wheels for pretty much all architectures. Um, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Are there any questions? <coughs>